Good morning. Wednesday night is Ash Wednesday, so we want you to join us on our Lenten journey. That's a journey between Wednesday and Easter, and just join us for that. It's a great time of uh, worship and pressing into the Lord. Tonight, I want to talk about, or t tonight, today, I kind of got those words mixed up. Did you hear that? Tonight. I made up a word. It's today and tonight. It's tonight. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to talk about where do you go to find what you're looking for? And the, the title of the sermon was going to be aimed at singles, and I, I totally had intended to do a sermon aimed at what the Bible says to those of you who are single. And if you find yourself in that neck of the woods, uh, there, there was single, there was divorced, there was uh, single that don't want a spouse, there's single that do want a spouse, there's single that, that have been, you know, it, there was a lot of different kinds of singles, and I thought, you know, maybe if the Lord can use something I'm going to say today about some single ladies in the Bible that we find, and maybe it'll be a help to you, and uh, it's a little different style of sermon, so kind of go with me. If it stinks, I won't do it next week, I promise, um, but I want to tell you some stories Instead of reading the Bible stories to you, I'm going to tell them to you, and we're going to talk through what that means to us, because we want to find what it is we need. Where do you go when you need to get what you're looking for? And we're going to start with a guy named Abram. Abram was in, in Genesis chapter 12. Um, he, uh, he, was a, he was a guy that God told Abram to go. I got one of these legs shorter than the other. I got to fix that. I'm a little dyslexic here. Uh, dyslexic, OCD, whatever you call it. I don't know. <laughs> There we go. I think it's OCD on that, isn't it? All right. So Abram, uh, God says, go into the land I'm going to show you. I'm going to bless you. In other words, leave your home, pick up and go. So he did. And God made a covenant with Abram and he changed his name to Abram. Wait a minute. Abram. Ooh, I messed that all up. Start over. Okay. Abraham. All right. So his name was Abram. We added a syllable. What's the syllable for? That's the name of God in their language. Remember, God, when he made a covenant with Abram, changed his name to Abraham. And that was the presence of God. It was the name of God. And then God took on Abram's name. From here on out in the Bible, after this Genesis 12 moment, we call him the God of Abraham. Isn't that neat? That whole covenant thing? That's a whole other sermon. But anyway... Abraham's getting old, and he's got a wife who's named, I'm dropping things, who's named Sarah, and uh, they don't have any kids yet, but yet God had promised them kids. He's 100, and she's 90 years old. No kids yet. And then they get pregnant with this miracle baby and have a baby, and his name is Isaac, all right? Isaac would have been that guy at the kindergarten class meeting with the teachers when they have the orientation, you know? And the teacher says, where's your parents, Isaac? And look in the corner, the guy in the walker, that's my dad, you know? He was old, okay? <laughs> it's just the way it was. Isaac had the old parents. And so Abraham is older. Isaac is older. Now he begins to talk to Isaac and says, Isaac, I want you to find a woman. You need a wife because God's going to bless our whole family and through our family, the whole world is going to be blessed. But I don't want you to look local. The girls around here are trouble with a capital T. <laughs> I need you to go back to the homeland, back where we're from, and you go back there. In fact, no, 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 you can't go back there. Scratch that. Send your servant back there because if you go back there, bad things are... Swear to me, you won't go back there. Send your servant. So Abram sends Isaac's servant back to the land they were coming from to find a spouse. So he goes, and he's got 10 camels with him. And the only reason he found the old homeland, I mean, they didn't have street signs, they didn't have roads or bridges, was an angel of the Lord guided the servant, okay? And so they're, they're around a well, and there's a, you know, camped around the well or other people because the well is a source of life and vitality and purity and rest in the ancient culture because there weren't rivers running through it. It was very arid. And he says to himself, self, I got to find a woman for my man back home. How do I do that? I tell you what, God, here's the deal. I'm going to ask a girl for a drink. And if she says to me, here's a drink, and can I water your camels too? 
that's going to be the girl that I should pick. I don't know any other way to do it, God, because I don't know where the women are in this town. First girl he sees is a girl named Rebecca. Now, Rebecca is coming down to just get some water for whoever and um, draw some water up in her jar. And so Isaac's servant says to Rebecca, will you give me a drink? And she takes the jar that was on her shoulder and lowers it and pours him a drink. Now, he either had a cup or he cupped his hands. We don't know which. And he thought to himself, okay, that's the first half. And then he says, he waits. And she says to him, and I will water your camels too. And he was like, ding, 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 ding. This is the person I'm looking for. And so right then he slaps a bunch of jewelry on her. He puts some bracelets on her wrist. He puts a ring in her nose. Now, I don't know how or why this was a good deal. I don't think you should try it today, boys, if you're looking for a girl. Don't slap a ring on her nose. Not right off the bat. You might ask her first. But uh, so that's what he did. And so Rebecca is kind of excited about this. That, 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 you know, and so Isaac's servant tells him the story. The whole family goes back, and, and, and Rebecca and her brother Laban and her mama are around, and Isaac's servant says, listen, the Lord sent me to find a man, a woman for my man. And Abraham sent me back here to his brother's household. And here's how it went down, and, when I, and, I, and I gave the test to God, and he came through, and Rebecca shows up. And so Laban, her brother, says, well, it must be God. He, you, got the, you got the right house. But can you just wait and just stay here for 10 more days? Isaac's servant said, no way, man. I got important business. We got to get back to Isaac's house, and they got to start getting busy making babies, and so it's got to happen. And so Laban says, just wait a minute. How about 10 days? Just, just 10 days? No, got to go. Let's ask the girl. So they ask Rebecca, and Rebecca says, I'll go with the stranger. I'm out of here, you know? So she, she heads off. And what's really cool is she, is she comes up to Isaac. They, they, they camel across who knows how many miles. And she sees Isaac out in the field working. And she asks the servant, who's that guy over there? In other words, who's that guy over there, right? Well, that's my master Isaac. He's going to be your husband. And she's like, oh, I got to put my veil on for him. Woohoo! Get fancy. And so they do. And they get together. And Isaac and Rebecca have children. They love one another. The promise is still secure. Well, one of the children they have, right? You know, when these two got together, they made a Jacob. All right, and the family line is going to continue through Jacob because it's not going to continue through Esau. We talked about that a few weeks ago, how Jacob stole his brother's blessing. Esau was the older brother, but Jacob took it anyway. And Isaac has this same talk with Jacob that Abraham had with Isaac. Isaac says, Jacob, you need to find a wife. But the local girls are kind of skanky. You don't want them around here. So, so go into, the, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the old Hebrew right there. I don't know if they had a word for that. But you don't want the Canaanite girls. They're not good, okay? So go back to the hometown and, and you're going to find your wife from your uncle Laban's home. Now remember, back then I guess the genetic line was pure enough that you could marry a cousin and it was legal. Don't try it today. You might get put in jail or in trouble or you don't want that, right? Amen? Don't marry your cousin, my mom always said. All right, so they could do that then. I'm kidding. My mom never said that. Okay. So Jacob goes to the well. It might have been the same well. We don't know. And there are a lot of sheep around the well and a couple of shepherds and Jacob goes, hey, shepherds, I'm looking for Laban. He's my uncle. I'm supposed to come find a wife here. Is he well? And you're like, well, yeah, we know Laban, and yeah, he's well. And look there. Coming down the hillside, that's his daughter. To which Jacob said, oh, my. It is a good day to be me. There is a lovely girl. And the Bible says her name was Rachel, and she was lovely of form. Now, I don't know what that means, but she was rocking a hot body under that robe. And Jacob, <laughs> Jacob knew, right? She's the one. And, and he went overboard. Now, guys, again, I don't say that you should do this on a first date for you single guys, but he broke down crying. 
He wept aloud. He was like, oh, the girl in my dreams, I didn't know what I was going to get when I came here. And look at this. Oh, my gosh, you are God, you know. <laughs> so he was enthralled with her. He goes back to the house because Rebecca's excited. She's never been wept over. I mean, she had guys pull up in a limo and all that, but never did anybody cry on a first date. Can you imagine how Rachel felt that moment, right? All right. So she takes him back home and introduces him to dad, Uncle Laban. And, and Laban's been down this road before. A generation ago, his sister Rebecca got married off because of the well. And now his own daughter is meeting some stranger that says he's Rebecca's son. So he's my, he's my nephew? Okay. I'll invite him into the house. He was excited to have Jacob around. Jacob was excited to work for his uncle Laban because he loved Rachel and looked at her and thought, man, there's my future. And Laban said, Jacob, what do you want? You got to get paid. I mean, even though I'm a relative and you're not going to work for free. And Jacob said, the only thing I want is Rachel. I'll work for you for seven years. Woo, that's a lot of love right there, right? Can you imagine having to wait seven years, going to the father of the one you married, some of you men? And you're like, yeah, I'll give, I'll give you seven years of my best labor. Okay, so he did. And the Bible says those seven years went by like it was a day. It was so awesome to be around his girlfriend. So on the wedding night, Laban pulled something that is a little PG-13. So kids, you might want to close your ears, okay? All right, so. Uh, I'll put this delicately. Parents, you can fill in the blanks when you get home, okay? <laughs> Laban has another daughter named Leah. And somehow, I don't know if Jacob got so lit up he couldn't see straight or what on the wedding night. But Laban snuck Leah in the tent rather than giving Jacob Rachel like he wanted. And so apparently Jacob became one with Leah. And in the morning, he wakes up and he doesn't see Rachel, he sees Leah. And the Bible says that Leah had weak eyes. That's the only description. Rachel's got the hot body, Leah's got weak eyes. And that's who he ends up with. And he's like, what have you done to me? I, I, I gave seven years for Rachel and you gave me Leah. And then Laban says, well, you know, around here, a boy's got to take the oldest daughter first. It's not our custom to marry off the youngest before the oldest, so you're going to have to deal with it. In seven days, I'll give you, Rachel, if you'll work for me, another seven years. Laban was a trickster, and Jacob was a trickster too, and he just got owned. But he was going to hang on for another seven years because he loved Rachel so much. But Leah is another part of the story. You got Rachel, who was loved, and then you got Leah, who was still married to this joker, not by her choice, but she was unloved. And we're going to come back to her story in a minute. But all of this stuff got started at the well. At the well is where they found what they needed. And, and the well, again, is, is something where life and vitality and purity and rest happen. But you'll see this metaphor throughout Scripture in the Old Testament about where when people get what they really need, they find it at a well. And over and over and over, you'll see these narratives. And, and I'm pulling out this me metaphor a little bit, and I think it might be a little bit of a stretch, but here's what I think. The well is our source in life. It's the living presence of God that presents to me everything I need in the moment I need it and not any sooner. Because God knows, do you know this? God knows what I really need. Say Amen. God knows where I am at all times, and God knows how to deliver what I need where I am. A lot of times you think, well, maybe God's forgotten about me, or maybe I'm not on his favorite list this week. But what I know is if you go to the well, if you go to the place where you find his presence, where you go to the source of living water, he'll give you what you need in the moment to get you to the next moment. God will never leave you high and dry. So when I'm disappointed by life, I go to the well. When I'm looking for answers, 
I get to the well. When I'm feeling lonely or discouraged by this job, I go to the well. When I'm feeling worn out by life, I get worn out a lot. So do you. I go to the well. You see, there's a lot of things in life that are pretend wells. All right? I'll just start listing them. I need a spouse. I need a great job. I need a lot of money. I need a great vacation, right? It's like, if I get all those in a row and I got good health to enjoy it all, then I'll have what I'm looking for. That's where I should go if I want to get what I need. I got to have a good spouse, a good job. I got to have a lot of money. I want to take great vacations and be healthy enough to enjoy them. That is kind of the American dream in a nutshell, but what happens when you get those things? Have you, have you ever noticed this? I don't care what kind of accomplishment you've ever, have you ever set your mind on a goal or you got that job or that trophy or that belt? You got the championship. You got what you thought would bring you fulfillment and, and keep you full for a long time. But what happens? You get that thing. And it doesn't scratch the itch entirely. It's like, it, it's fun for a minute, but then you're like off to the next thing. You get a little money, you want a little more, right? You get a spouse and you're thinking, wait a minute, they're going to complete me. It's Jerry Maguire all over again. You complete me. <laughs> and then you get married and you find out it's a lot of work. And there's still some holes. In fact, they make me mad. And you'll be inclined to think if you're not careful that you picked the wrong one. I better find another one. Because obviously, the first one I was wrong. Or the job that I have now. Man, it was great when I started, but man, I'm so mad at those people. I can't forget what they said to me. I can't forgive them more for what they've done to me. This is a stinking job. I don't care how much money it is. And, and then you go hop into another job because, again, you're trying to scratch an itch that can't be scratched this side of eternity. There's always going to be something missing with earthly delivery systems. Every single one that we think ought to bring us ultimate pleasure and fulfillment always fall short. And we know this. In our, in our quiet moments, when we get honest with ourselves, there's no human, there's no job, there's no accomplishment or vacation that's always going to do it for us. It's only when we understand that we come to the well is the source of life and hope and health and healing. And the well is the presence of Almighty God. And we seek after that. God's not far away. He's available to those who call upon him. He's available through the spoken word. When God's word goes out, remember, God's word can come out of you. Did you know that? See, you can become a well for others when they're dry. Because when you speak God's words, out of your mouth comes living water. And the world needs living water. In fact, Jesus made it a point to wrap up the well narratives in John chapter 4. If you want to look in your Bible later, I'll just write it up here to see it. And he appeared at a well. All my art teachers are going crazy because I'm using 3D right now, right? That's a well, if you didn't know. There's a little rope and a little bucket and going down there. I'm in 3D and I'm, I'm, I'm going through the, the bricks right now, okay? <laughs> teachers are impressed, all right? So here's Jesus, and he's sitting at the well. I'm putting the cross there just to symbolize Jesus. His boys are in town. This is a place called Sychar. It's a well. Again, there's no rivers running through here for people to get water. His disciples, John and the boys, are in town. Jesus is all alone. He's got a chair, so let's draw a chair. All right, there's Jesus on the chair. All right. Sitting two legs. There we go. All right, there's the butt. Okay, Jesus had a butt. Oh, okay. He's sitting at the well. And a woman comes up, all alone, and Jesus says to her, woman, would you give me a drink? Sounds eerily similar to something Isaac's servant said thousands of years before. Woman, would you give me a drink? And she looks at him and says, we're in Sychar. That's Samaritan territory, and you're a Jew. You guys, we don't talk. Why are you asking me for a drink? You think I'm unclean. Like I'm an animal or something, right? And Jesus said to her, woman, 
if you knew who just asked you for a drink, you would have been asking him for a drink. And he would have given you living water. And you will never thirst again if you get this water. Well, how do I get that water? How are you going to get that water? You don't even have a jug and a rope. And Jesus began to talk to her. Listen, the kind of water I give, a person would never thirst again. In other words, I'm the source. He's speaking these words, and then she's kind of clicking with this conversation saying, okay, so you're saying you're like God. Our, our, our whole system of religion in the Samaritan system says there's going to be a Messiah. You guys, we agree on that, right? And Jesus said, listen, you're looking at the Messiah, the one who is speaking to you. I am he. And she's like, oh, wow, this is a big deal. And Jesus said, go, go get your husband. Let's talk about this some more. At which the woman said, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right. You've had five. And now you're living with number six. And she's like, whoa, how did you know? I can see you're a prophet. In fact, I'm taking off, running to home. She runs back to town. And comes back out to the well. And she comes and announces when she gets to town, she says this, come see a man. Come see a man. To which all the women in the town are going, shut up. You've had five. It's a small town. You've taken our husbands. Now you're going to tell me there's another man that's going to make you happy? She said, come see a man that told me everything I'd ever done. In other words, come see a man who really knows me and he doesn't seem to condemn me which is kind of wild and he doesn't want anything from me come see a man and they all come out to town and they hear the words of Jesus and they begin to drink from his words like they're drinking from a hot fire hydrant and at the end of the chapter it says now we don't believe in him because you said we believe because of what we heard in other words not only did the woman at the well get filled with living water so did every person that connected with Jesus they had dropped their rope in that well for years and they had always come up with water but nothing ever would last to fulfill what they needed until they met Jesus. Now, I'm here to tell you today, he is the source you need. You don't need the someone. You need the source. So stop looking for a someone to fulfill and pin all your hopes on for your future. You need the source of life, not another life in your home. Now, if you get two people committed to Jesus, committed to the source, and they hook up and get together, it is heaven on earth, folks. That's what God has designed marriage to be all about, that when two people who love God and love one another create life, out of love flows life. Isn't that cool? That's what God has designed for marriage. And a lot of times marriages break down when we pin so much on a marriage that it can never do. And that's why they always say, like, man, I got to find another one. I got to find another source. But when you have the source and you have the source coming from you, you know how to forgive. You know how to let go of things. You know how to get along with people. But it takes two people seriously committed to God and committed to one another to hang on through hell and high water. Because what happens in marriage? Hell and high water, right? You don't believe it. Just ask around to folk that have been married a while. How did you stay together? Uh, <laughs> we stuck together. <laughs> That's what you do, right? God is our source. And at the well, they found it. Don't look for success. Look to the source. Don't look for someone. Look for the source. You've got to reorient your mind and your heart and your life around the well. The well is not an optional part of your day if you think about it. The presence of God is not something you just get when people sing to you. The presence of God is something you seek after. With all, you reorient your life about staying near the well. And then you let the well water come out of you. See, the Bible says, is anyone thirsty? In Isaiah 51, 5, 1, come and drink. It's always an open invitation for us to drink and to give praise to the Lord. To drink and give praise out of our mouth. And out of our mouth, the words of God become life-giving fountains for the people in our home. And I'm telling you, parents, if you're a parent in this room, and we talked about it last week, 
But if you could do one thing, the, the one thing that your kids need most, the one thing is they need to hear God's word spoken out of your mouth so that they can lap up that living water and ingrain it into their bodies and their souls and their minds. Instead of complaining about stuff, begin to praise the Lord in front of your kids. Let them know how much Jesus means to you and how much he's given life to you. And if you've never told your testimony to your children, they need to hear it. They need to hear what it was like when you came to Jesus. Even if it was as a child, they need to know your story. It's a life-giving fountain so that when they face the tough times in their life, they'll know how to deal with it. But let me come back to Leah's story because this is cool. Leah was the forgotten one. She was the throw-in in the deal. Not fair to be Leah. Laban was a bad man to do that to his daughter. And she was broken. Broken by life. Decisions of others that she couldn't control. Many of you have been broken by life. Other people have hurt you and there's nothing you could do to stop it. And so she thought through childbirth that she would regain that thing that she needed. And here's her story. In Genesis 29, verse 32, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. And you just ache for her, don't you? She conceived again, and, and she gave birth to a son. She said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. She tried three times to name her children through the pain that she was feeling. She wanted everybody to know, man, this is going to be it. This is going to be the one. And, and she waited for months with that life growing inside of her. And her mind was fantasizing the moment that Jacob would come to her and hug her and embrace her and say, I'm sorry, I should have loved you like I should have loved you the whole time. I know I love Rachel, but I love you too. There was no room in Jacob's heart for that. But Leah longed to be loved. But it didn't come. But look what happens in this last verse. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. And I don't know where you're at in life. So she named him Judah. I don't know where you're at in life, but I got this moment in my heart here that some of you are really struggling. You feel a little unloved or forgotten about or left out by life. And you've been trying a lot of different ways and avenues and roads in life to see if you can get what you need and it's not working. But this time she praised the Lord. And she had a son named Judah. Now, if you were to look back, well, if you were to look back in the ancestry tree of Leah, who had Judah, you know, Jesus is referred to as the lion of Judah, isn't he? From the unloved one comes the one who loved us with all his heart. You see, Isaiah 53 said that Jesus would be a man of sorrows, like one that we would turn our face away from, not pleasant to look at. And when we saw Jesus on the cross, we know that we've seen this great, 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 great grandson of Leah who was acquainted with suffering and loneliness and despair. But out of her life, when she finally said, this time... I will praise the Lord. I don't care what's happened to me. I don't care who's overlooked me. I don't care how I've been neglected by life. I've gotten the short end of the stick the whole time. But you know what? There is a God in heaven who loves me the way I am. He made me the way I am. I am going to praise him and let him know that there is nothing going to stand in the way of my praise. It's going to be living water for my children. It's going to be living water for people thousands of years later. Here we sit. We sit in this room because a woman named Leah made a choice to praise the Lord. And in that moment, God changed history. I can use a woman like that. 
I can use a woman who doesn't need everything right in her life before she praises me, and I'm going to bring the Messiah from her because that's the way life was meant to be lived, with me as the source. He is our source of life, folks. Don't ever forget it. Don't walk away from him. You got to run to him. In just a moment, I want our band to come up. Come on up, band. Is your spirit dry today? You might need to come kneel at the well, up in the balcony, online in your living room. Is your soul in despair? Do you feel left out and useless to the world? Maybe you just need to come to the well and kneel in prayer. Do you have a physical need, something that needs fixing that's broken right now? You might need to come and pray with some of our intercessors down here, some of our staff, because that's the well, folks. It's the source of life. It's the place where you get what you need. And Jesus is waiting. Would you stand with me? Father, I thank you for the Bible and how it shows us a different way of interpreting life. It keeps pointing us back to the living water and we keep putting in substitutes from popularity to great pictures on Instagram. And all that, none of that satisfies for very long, Lord. And we know that you're the source, but we keep rolling past it and trying to name things that will make us happy and it hasn't worked. So for every person in this room that feels dry, lonely, afraid, worried, ashamed, Lord, give them the courage to take a step out of their seats and come kneel in your presence. And Lord, we thank you for this day. The well is here for anybody that will come and drink. In Jesus' name, amen.